Sweet Baby Inc. is in a lot of trouble, and funny enough, they are only getting themselves into more trouble the more they try to defend themselves. However, as much as they are a problem in this situation, they are only a symptom of an even greater issue facing gaming as a whole, of which, if it is not addressed for what it really is, this problem will never go away, but in fact will only grow as it continues to receive more attention. In this video, I'm going to go over what Sweet Baby Inc. is, both from the understanding of who they present themselves to be, as well as who they are behind the brand, why they have been the ones attacked for what isn't the overall whole and real issue, breaking down the message, and why it is being rejected, as well as to discuss what the actual problem is regarding this entire situation. I'm sure this is going to be quite the roller coaster ride for many, but I'm going to do my best to break everything down in a much more manageable way to better understand exactly what's going on. Without further ado, let's discuss the controversy surrounding Sweet Baby Inc. and the message they are supporting. Men, cis, hetero, male, ah! white male characters are very, very niche. White and male, white male characters are very, very niche. Cis, white, hetero, male, male, men, white, men, white. You want to play a little game? I used to be so happy without you. You ruined me. To better understand the overall issue, we have to understand what Sweet Baby Inc. is as a company. Sweet Baby Inc. Uh, is actually derived from the fact that we worked with a lot of different teams in, in previous times. And every time we worked with someone who we really vibed with, or we really felt like, okay, this is really, really going well, we would go like, wow, they were such sweet babies. And when we started Sweet Baby, we said, we only want to work with sweet babies. From their website, their About Me section says, founded in 2018 by Kim Belair. I am Kim Belair. Um, I'm a writer and a narrative designer, a narrative director, and, and team lead of uh, lots of different titles that I wear, but un they're all underneath CEO of Sweet Baby Inc. Sweet Baby Inc. is a narrative development and consultation studio based in Montreal and working around the globe. Our mission is to tell better, more empathetic stories while diversifying and enriching the video game industry. We aim to make games more engaging, more fun, more meaningful, and more inclusive for everyone. Reading between the lines, they are a consulting company game developers and studios have used to help write diverse stories, aka they are DEI and ESG activists who care more about diversity through checking boxes rather than telling diverse stories with good characters, shoehorning their agendas once given the green light by game studios and developers. Some examples of their work are God of War Ragnarok, changing Angra Boda to being black. I will come back to that point later on, as it is important. Alan Wake 2, where you split playing between the namesake character himself but also by a self-insert, personality and all, from one of the people who helped develop the game. Starfield, with the controversial FUCKING PRONOUNS! FUCKING GENDER AMBIGUITY! FUCKING CURRENT DAY CALIFORNIAN SHIT! Spider-Man 2, with Peter being nerfed to allow Miles Morales to shine. Peter struggled to defeat enemies, but Miles could handle them very easily. They also empty corner chaired Peter in his own game. The MJ missions were increased, as those within Insomniac have said, we know people didn't like her missions in the first game, but we added more because we want players to like playing as her, and she could even take out enemies as a normal person with just a stun gun. And again, Peter couldn't take out the same enemies despite having powers. Also, the handoff from Peter to Miles at the end... Don't do it, game. Don't do it. Don't make Miles Spider-Man, bro. Don't do it, game. Go be Peter Parker for a while. <gasps> so it's gonna be Miles who fights Green Goblin, huh? And the last of the examples here, is Suicide Squad kill the Justice League? With everything that Batman had to go through for his Arkham trilogy, how could you allow Batman to die by just a simple gunshot from Harley Quinn? Something that has been discovered to be quite the controversy for Sweet Baby Inc., which only makes the examples that were given have more credibility of being done for agenda and narrative pushing, is the company's connection to Gamergate. For those unfamiliar, Gamergate, according to its Wikipedia, was a loosely organized misogynistic online harassment campaign and a right-wing backlash against feminism, diversity, and progressivism in video game culture. It was conducted using the hashtag Gamergate, primarily in 2014 and 2015. Beginning in August 2014, Gamergate targeted women in the video game industry, most notably feminist and media critic Anita Sarkeesian and video game developers Zoe Quinn and Brianna Wu. The harassment campaign included doxing, threats, and death threats. However, what really started it was because Zoe Quinn's ex-boyfriend, Aaron Joni, wrote a blog about her that got traction within different forums. Zoe Quinn had made a game called Depression Quest, and some media outlets were giving it high praise, especially Kotaku. What Aaron had said was that Zoe had a relationship with an employee at Kotaku, Nathan Grayson, which is why her game was getting very favorably reviewed. Players spoke out against the favoritism being shown, and Kotaku had to run damage control to save face, mentioning that yes, they were in a relationship, 
but he didn't write the review, and Zoe was only mentioned once. But players could see that, even if this was true, to do a favor for a coworker is not an uncommon practice. All the backlash towards this incident is what really set off Gamergate, as players just wanted games to be more fairly reviewed, not being given any favoritism because of the person developing the game or the person writing the review. The gamers, they wanted their game journalism to be done fairly. I want you to remember not only the name Zoe Quinn, but how Kotaku tried to cover up and run damage control for someone that they knew within the gaming industry. As just with how Gamergate is doing now, history will repeat itself, but so much worse the next time around. To be able to understand the connection with Gamergate, we need to look at a few companies involved with Sweet Baby Inc. Firstly, Baby Ghosts, which is, according to their websites about me, the nonprofit arm of a social impact investment firm Weird Ghosts, delivering year-round programs to support underrepresented game developers and founders in Canada. Baby Ghosts and Gamma Space Collaborative Studio have teamed up to offer grants of $25,000 in a two-part, six-month program of tailored mentorship with a community of game-making peers. We offer you the space and the tools to develop a studio that doesn't need to adhere to inadequable, systematic norms. We provide grants to game studios run by founders who face marginalization and underrepresentation due to gender, race, queerness, disability, religion, housing status, economic status, immigration, or citizenship status. We foster community engagement and support among underrepresented game developers and founders through tailored mentorship, skill building workshops, and business development programs. We conduct research, data collection, and publishing on the topic of equitable game funding in Canada. As far as their services, they provide team development, project management, story development, workflow, publicity, solidarity strategies, work and life balance, and professional connections, which is a key to remember for the last section, which is the more that you engage with us and the broader community, the better that we can support you. The more that we get to know and work with you, the more that we can answer your questions, provide high level support, and help fill production gaps. Meaning, the better that they know you as a person, especially in consideration of being someone who is so marginalized based on identity politics, the more that they can support you. And how could one potentially receive a grant from them? Their eligibility is based on being in Canada, as well as you are a member of an underrepresented group in the video game industry. And on top of the list of what they are looking for is social impact. Now, there was a company that I quickly mentioned, being Weird Ghost, as they are the social impact investment firm within these companies. According to their websites about me, they are an impact fund for studios led by underrepresented founders across Canada. We support video game studios with studio development training, catalytic investments, and community in order to build strong, impactful teams of underrepresented makers who are shaping the future of games. Weird Ghost invests in founders who want to build profitable, impact-oriented studios with long-term vision and commitment to equitable, work-centric structures. From the last part, the key takeaway is that they want to build profitable, impact-oriented studios, thus tying into Baby Ghost that is wanting to look to create social impact, therefore wanting what they make to try to be the voice for change in the way that people play and enjoy video games, of which, the more they get to know and work with you, as they oversee your work and help expand your studio size and production, would have more of a hand in keeping the messaging and narrative pushing going through your work. Now, all of this is a lot to digest, but this rabbit hole goes much deeper than this. When looking through those who are running these companies, something that stuck out greatly to me was for Baby Ghost staff, with Elaine Mary Holoka, using they, she pronouns, is a queer and disabled white settler living on Treaty 1 territory in Winnipeg. Then, for Jenny Robinson Faber, pronoun of she, is a queer white settler, community arts advocate and organizer, software developer, and a leader in the IDM industry for over 15 years. Right off the bat, you can see the clear-cut message that both of these individuals are pushing, which will become confirmed later on in the most ironic way, but something in Eileen's About Me section caught my interest. Infinite Ammo, which, for what I'm sure their political aligning would be just based off their About Me, seems quite counterintuitive, so I wanted to take a look into that company as well. Infinite Ammo is a game studio created by Alec Aloka, the same man who took his own life after Zoe Quinn made unproven accusations of abuse against him, and the backlash that he faced was too much for him to bear, especially as the Believe All Women narrative started gaining traction, which demonizes men for the sake of their sex with the idea that women, solely off identity politics, are to be believed when opposed to a man's point of view regarding the same situation, especially in cases involving abuse or anything sexual. Then, after Alec's death, his sister Eileen took over Infinite Ammo to create Baby Ghost and Weird Ghost, which then eventually birthed Sweet Baby Inc. There is some irony in how this man, very sadly, took his own life because of unproven accusations from his ex, who was one of the original people harassed within Gamergate, who then had his company taken over and used to create their own companies who are now wanting to gatekeep and push their own agendas and narratives, while being racist to white people, of which both founders of Baby Ghost and Weird Ghost are white. 
So these new baby and ghost companies are doing similar, if not the same type of things that Gamergate had originally stood against, but now is acceptable and even encouraged through gaslighting and virtual signaling because it's against white people. Similar in mentioning with a prior point earlier, this will also be important to remember for later on as well. And last thing to tie this all up, courtesy of Sial on Twitter, shared some screenshots showing Chris Kendred, a narrative designer and writer at Sweet Baby Inc, saying that they were excited to be a part of the cohort of brands all linked together, which include Baby Ghost, Weird Ghost, and right in the middle, Sweet Baby Inc. Now that there's a clear understanding of who Sweet Baby Inc is, both as a facade, as well as when looking at those who helped to create it and its parent companies, let's dive into the recent events involving the Steam Curator group, Sweet Baby Inc. Detected. This group was created to help show all of the games that Sweet Baby Inc. has been involved in, regardless of the level in which they are involved, for those who may want to avoid said games because of the narrative and agenda pushing. With many whom dislike Sweet Baby Inc. taking notice to help the group get its early follower count, it also caught the attention of some of Sweet Baby Inc.'s employees as well. One of the employees had begged their followers to mass report the Steam Curator group, as well as the curator himself. Funny enough, being Chris Kendred, the same person who was excited in joining the Sweet Baby Inc. cohort from the prior chapter. It's weird to think because if their cause really was so noble, that's low key noble, and helped with representation and diversity in the manner that they claimed it did, and was for a good cause, why would someone showing off your catalog of work be a bad thing? Even if it generates negative interest at first, wouldn't you want people to see the content that you put effort into towards being representative of underrepresented groups and marginalized people? This started creating a lot of attention, and at an especially exponential growth, not only for the Steam group, but also with the negative attention directed at Sweet Baby Inc., with even a former World of Warcraft team member chiming in on the discussion, bringing up similar talking points to my prior suspicion and fueling the criticism of the sincerity of the messaging they are pushing. With Sweet Baby Inc. opening Pandora's box through the Streisand effect, they ended up trying to run damage control, with a PR representative sounding incredibly immature towards criticism, similar to how a baby cries and complains when they don't get their way. That will be very important to remember for later on. One of the employees made a remark about people who are participating in the curation of race. But the irony in that is the person who started the curation group is Brazilian, not white as they most likely assumed. You guys are Portuguese, speak, right? Yeah, Brazilian yeah. Portuguese. The CEO, Kim Belair, shows her disdain for white male lead characters, while one of her employees shows her dislike for white people in general. Let's first look at the latter. And because so many of these cancel culture activists like to use things that others have said in their past against them, let's take a look at the employee who dislikes white people, seeing what they have said in their past. I don't know why games featuring human characters are still so white and male. Pay me to shoot down your white male lead game ideas. Looking around the mixer last night put into perspective just how white and male our dev scene really is. It really is white and male. Had a nightmare that I was a white male gamer. Oh yeah, that's... that's nice. That, that escalated quite quickly. All of this from the same person who talks about spreading misinformation and how people can be racist in public with no consequences. Accountability. What's that? Now circling back to the CEO, Kim Belair. I'm gonna mix her GDC conference presentation in 2019 with her Complications in Suit interview from 2020, where she explained the importance of her cause with Sweet Baby Inc., as there's a lot of overlapping talking points between the two source materials that add context to one another. She claimed that, after so many years since the first of video games, why are games looking so similar? And the story is not landing with younger audiences, of which doesn't seem to grow. That representation is innovation, and those who ask for diverse stories don't just want characters to be washed and or reskinned to tell the same story. That bringing in people from different backgrounds, different genders, and different cultures that will help to tell different stories that haven't been seen before. Representation is this like very, very scary and very uncertain thing. And if we do it wrong, or if we don't do it, you know, accurately, or if we kind of take a risk, we might get shouted down and that fear is enough to stop us. And I think like, that sucks. I would genuinely love just once to be called into one of these consulting sessions and instead of being asked like, hey, can you tell us how this is gonna hurt people like you? Just be asked, hey, what would you like to see people like you do in this game? What experiences can people like you bring to the world of the game that we haven't seen before? What's a cool thing that you wanna see from characters who look and act like you? Assume your players want new stories and treat representation as a facet of innovation, as a selling point. Leverage your game's ability to explore new perspectives. Um, and there's always gonna be a positive impact in assuming this. I can understand that and see how that can help to shape good stories from those who could and would have the experience to tell them in an immersive and engaging way. However, where I wanted to agree with her in that regard, she follows this up with, when looking at demographics, okay, so the majority of our player base is white male, so let's make stuff for white males. But if you make stuff from the perspective of Asian trans women and it's really strong, it will work for people. 
Because I think so often when people like us get told, you know, from higher ups or from society at large, this isn't what players want, it's not a conversation about demographics, sorry, content, it's a conversation about demographics. And I think that in our industry and in so many creative industries, if you want to look at film and television and any art form, we start treating our core demographics as a fixed and static value, something that does not want to change and something that is locked in place. So despite like the changing face of audiences, despite the changing face of conferences like this one, we still look at our core demographics and say, okay, they're white, cis, hetero, males. And we cater almost exclusively to them. And the problem is that we don't just cater to them like, you know, here, here's something that we think you'll enjoy. We cater them the way that we cater to like a picky baby. We feed them the same thing that we know that they love and we keep on feeding it. We're like, here you go, we, you love it. Eat this, eat this, eat this. So that then when they get anything else, they react as a picky baby would, which is be like, oh no, thank you. I do not want this. And we've actually done this so long that what we're doing is creating an entire nation of picky babies and they make us scared to deviate from what we actually want to do. Just in case these picky babies don't want to play our games. And we've made a lot of progress. Obviously, like I don't say this to just completely go like, just give up, we've, <laughs> we've screwed it. Um, but I think it's still amazing that I can be seated in a meeting and told that out of 12 characters, we already have one black one, so there can't possibly be a second. <laughs> hey, maybe we can invite white dudes to play as other people and experience different things through someone else's eyes. And if they don't like it, we have to start thinking we're not losing, they're losing, and we're losing because we're gonna let them stand in the way of our progress and our innovation. She continued with, people crave new stories. And if you wanna innovate and even stay current, it's not about graphics or hardware. It's about opening up new perspectives for people. So it's important to game development to diversify. It's not just part of advocacy and activism. It's going to make games better. Because none of what we're doing is about ticking boxes or about a veneer of wokeness. We actually have to care about making this stuff. She further continued with, the market has always been frustrating to me because we make assumptions based on what we already have instead of what we could have. A couple of months ago, we were talking about player's choice in Assassin's Creed. People were saying, well, no matter how good this female character is, a majority of the players played as the male character. So therefore, people prefer male characters. I think that we need to stop thinking that our like core marketing demographics have to define the exact demographics of our playable characters and of our cast. And instead, we start to have to assume that players do want new stories and that if we bring joy to our broad audience, it's going to encompass our core audience as well. And what I had to explain was, no, actually, from a marketing and psychology perspective, most people are going to choose the gender that they most align with. It doesn't mean that that's what they want. If you are male identified, it's not that you don't want to play as a woman. You're just going, oh, that one's for me. I'm a guy. I don't go to the ladies room. But I do like to imagine that when we look at uh, white guys, and there's several of you here, um, I think that when we look at you, we say, okay, you can't possibly enjoy this. But I think they want also, and maybe you want also, to experience new and different stories. I think we need to step out of this rule that like white men can enjoy fantasy worlds, aliens, sci-fi, monsters, anything, so long as it's through a lens that looks exactly like them. Because if that's the kind of person that we're always going to cater to, you're never going to innovate. You're never going to change things. You're just going to keep feeding the picky baby. And we cannot continue to try to create art under a system that is going to bar innovation for fear of a picky baby throwing a tantrum. She then discusses the struggles of trying to bring her ideas within DEI into games. Wouldn't it be amazing if this wasn't an accident, but it was actually the intention of the game designers? What if they actually said, you know what, we're gonna set out to create a moment of joy in people who look like this, people who feel represented by this. What's stopping us? Like, why are we still being told, oh no, that's not what players want? Why do I keep hearing that it's like an uphill battle for people to bring representation to what should be a very inclusive environment of creativity? You know, there are a lot of answers. There's the fact that, you know, the industry stuck in its ways. Uh, the industry isn't as diverse as it should be or could be. Um, we're all socialized in this society to kind of act against it and to fall into what is normal. And there's like a dozen other answers. They're all like variations on those themes. Then if all of this isn't enough to show her true intentions, she also mentions a way to get her message across through scare tactics. Put this stuff up to your higher ups and if they don't see the value in what you're asking for when you ask for consultants, when you ask for research, go have a coffee with your marketing team and just terrify them 
with the possibility of what's gonna happen if they don't give you what you want. Because they have to consider, like, I, I say that all out as a joke, but it's actually very, very true. Wow, yeah, there's so much to unpack here. Where do I start? Let's understand something right off the bat. To have a character that is anything other than a white cis male is perfectly fine. There are plenty of great characters who don't fit that criteria who have been very fun to play as. Turok the Dinosaur Hunter, Lorecroft from Tomb Raider, CJ from Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, the Sorceress from Diablo 2, and Bayek from Assassin's Creed Origins, to name a few, all come to mind. Even with Cassandra in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, whom could have relationships equal to those of her counterpart Alexios, making her bi. Or even in Baldur's Gate 3, where any maid character, male, female, or anything else, can have the same love interest opportunities. And all of the aforementioned games have been successes in their respective franchises, and all of which are loved characters by the players of said games. In the same way that I wouldn't want to play a game that has to constantly remind me that there's DEI within it, I wouldn't want to play a game that's constantly reminding me that there's straight characters within it, or that there's white characters, or male characters. If the skin color, sexual orientation, gender, or any other identity politics characteristics of any character, protagonist or NPC, has nothing to do with advancing the plot, and or isn't an important focal point within the story, no matter what those characteristics may be, I don't care about them, as they would then have no deep meaning within the game, nor would they have any impact on the experience overall, and I'd rather just focus on the aspects that are prominent to the experience of the game as a whole. I'll never be opposed to playing anything other than what I am, a cis white male, because I'm a mature adult who understands that everyone in the world goes through their own adventures, and I don't have to play as myself or see someone similarly in-game to find ways to relate and empathize with the character, something Belair actually discussed how she used to never play as someone looking like herself. This is genuinely embarrassing to relate to a crowd of people, but for a really long time before this, when I was offered like a character customization screen, I was like, well, I can't put myself in there because that that's weird and not what video games are. And the idea of wanting to make content to help bring in new people, as well as to give players more familiarity within things and ideas, especially for those in more niche groups that typically wouldn't get much shine, is good to consider. However, what may sound good in concept, their execution towards making that idea a reality is where they truly sh the bed. Even worse than Amber did. Let's break it down. For the point on guys not wanting to play as a female-led character, then why is GTA 6 being so hyped up by both men and women, as it has only a female protagonist? But also, let's look at a game that I make content for on my channel, Diablo 2 Resurrected. For my D2 players, how many people do you see playing as a sorceress during ladder restart? The overwhelming majority of players choose her, and for good reason. Those who don't play her don't say, Ew, I don't want to play as a girl. While those who do play her also don't say, I want to play as a girl. What goes through their mind is, she can teleport. Then they all rush to make the rumored insight to help with not burning through mana to have her get through the game much, much faster than any other character. Thus getting into endgame content and leveling up other characters, as well as any other friends that are not a sorceress, that much easier and faster as well. However, I'm sure to make it to Blair's liking, all Blizzard would need to do is make a lady gay. Sure, yeah. To get the trifecta for needed representation, but players enjoy her character and the builds that she can have, and it literally has nothing to do with any identity politics whatsoever. Also, one of the most popular characters, the Paladin, he's not white either. But players also love using this character for the amazing builds that he has, one of which is literally the most popular Uber running character, especially since he can be very budgeted and still clear Ubers to be able to get a torch. She specifically mentioned Assassin's Creed, as they are currently working on Codename Red. Sadly, there's three female protagonists in the series that players seem to enjoy more than their male counterparts. Evie from Syndicate, since she is much more tactful and stealthy than her twin brother Jacob, who is all brute strength, as one of AC's highly regarded and enjoyed mechanics is stealth. Then there's Cassandra from Odyssey, whom is actually the canon character of the story, while Alexios is much more dull and unappealing when looking at how each one of the characters are written. Then for Valhalla, the female Ivor is also the canon character in the game. However, similarly to how some at Marvel claim that female-led movies won't sell, which is why the Black Widow movie came out well past the time that fans would care to be interested in it, since everyone knew that no matter what she did, she lived into the movie Endgame. Unfortunately, all three AC female protagonists mentioned were placed in the backgrounds of the marketing in favor of the male protagonist. However, that never stopped players from experiencing all three of the games as said female protagonists, with a future game, AC Hex, to feature only a female protagonist. The reason that players are resistant to the shoehorning of DEI and ESG narratives is because the overwhelming majority of the country doesn't agree with the ideologies being forced upon the majority by the minority, whom somehow have gained significant power to influence how society is shifting. And the player base doesn't like being told what they should and should not think, what they should and should not like, and how they should and should not act with ideologies that are so backwards thinking, 
whom think that children, who are too young to legally drink and drive, somehow simultaneously have the capacity and mindfulness to make life-changing decisions, such as removing working and healthy anatomy to affirm their gender. Some adults don't even understand what they want to do. Exactly, so, that's the kind so of how thing. can a child? Let's not underestimate the power of these kids today, okay? They are very much more educated because they have much more resources and access than we did. Bro, what are you talking about, man? Despite those same people claiming that gender isn't defined by one's genitals, but rather is all in one's head. Sex is what's between the legs and gender is what's between the ears, right? It's our, how we see ourselves on the inside. Gender is something somebody can't know just by looking at somebody. Nope, yeah. Which is why so many of them seem to be misgendered, since nobody is a mind reader. Your entire staff has been calling me sir. Okay. What are you? So I can call you a sir or a ma'am. What are you? What would you assume looking at me? I assume that you're a man. Okay. Excuse me, it's ma'am. It is ma'am. Bitch, where? They somehow think that they can write and make rules for what they clearly can't define. What is a woman? Well, can you tell me what a woman is? No, I can't. Womanhood is something that is an umbrella term. It includes people that who... That describes what? People who identify as a woman. I identify as what? As a woman. What is that? was to each their own. All because they have boiled down an entire sex to simply becoming a costume that can be worn and discarded as one pleases, instead of it being embedded in one's DNA. What you want to do is appropriate women. You want to appropriate womanhood okay. and turn it into basically a costume that can be worn. Day one of being a girl, and I have already cried three times, I wrote a scathing email that I did not send. I ordered dresses online that I couldn't afford. And then uh, when someone asked me how I was, I said, I'm fine when I wasn't fine. How'd I do, ladies? Good? Stop it. Get some help. Do you have any relationship to the concept of girlhood? I absolutely do. This mindset in America, in the Western world, is a sickness. It is deviant, and we do not want it. Eh? I'm not into all the other bullshit, I think. What other bullshit? The they and them. Yeah. And all that extra shit that we added during the pandemic because everyone was so bored on their fucking houses. They just started to make up more shit and more, more shit. More stuff, more stuff. Yeah. But you need someone like me that looks like me to say it. Because if you say it, it turns into your like You hate trans people. You hate gays. And it's just how you feel. You don't hate anyone. You just think it's stupid. Who believe that feelings matter over facts. And it's okay to rewrite history all because they feel it to be right since the truth isn't nice. And anyone who doesn't conform with their mindset is to be canceled and to have their lives ruined. All in the name of feeling oppressed by the truth, as well as by those who want to use logic, reasoning, and a realistic mindset over feeling that their truth is the truth that everyone needs to accept and accommodate for. Nobody has to accept another's lifestyle choices into their own personal lives, especially if it doesn't align with their own beliefs. What someone does in the privacy of their own home is none of anyone else's business and for themselves to decide. But for them to think that others need to accept and play along with their actions, especially with those whom live within delusions of reality, is up to the others to decide, not the one pushing their beliefs onto others. It's ironic how she claims she isn't trying to check boxes for the sake of wokeness. None of what we're doing is about ticking boxes or about a veneer of wokeness. We actually have to care about making this stuff. However, she also said, as a point of reference from earlier to remember, Because I think so often when people like us get told, you know, from higher ups or from society at large, this isn't what players want. It's not a conversation about demographics, sorry, content. It's a conversation about demographics. We start treating our core demographics as a fixed and static value, something that does not want to change and something that is locked in place. So despite like the changing face of audiences, despite the changing face of conferences like this one, we still look at our core demographics and say, okay, they're white, cis, hetero, males. And we cater almost exclusively to them. And the problem is that we don't just cater to them like, you know, here, here's something that we think you'll enjoy. We cater them the way that we cater to like a picky baby. So that then when they get anything else, they react as a picky baby would, which is be like, whoa, no, thank you. I do not want this. And we've actually done this so long that what we're doing is creating an entire nation of picky babies. And they make us scared to deviate from what we actually want to do just in case these picky babies don't want to play our games. I once worked on a project where they had an all white cast and they expressed their desire like, okay, we need to mix it up a bit. How about this character is kind of like stereotypically French. So they have a beret and they have like a striped shirt. And I was like, okay, if you need to do that, can we at least make them a person of color? And they said, oh no, that would be weird. They're already French. And I think that we need to stop 
thinking that our like core marketing demographics have to define the exact demographics of our playable characters and of our cast. And instead, we start to have to assume that players do want new stories, and that if we bring joy to our broad audience, it's going to encompass our core audience as well. This is why Angerboda was black in God of War Ragnarok, in a place that is filled with predominantly white people, making her the token character that Belair claimed that she didn't want to do with her underrepresented characters. Oh, we can build choices that consider, you know, marginalized identities and just write them into our work. We can decide to tell stories that pre present like, you know, very rare narratives and representative experiences. Um, and we can kind of work on detokenizing our minority characters. Which in turn, sounds an awful lot like checking boxes, but for, using her words, white people. Additionally, with her also mentioning that white people would need to play games through the eyes of those just like them. But I do like to imagine that when we look at uh, white guys, and there's several of you here, um, I think that when we look at you, we say, okay, you can't possibly enjoy this, but I think they want also, and maybe you want also, to experience new and different stories. I think we need to step out of this rule that like white men can enjoy fantasy worlds, aliens, sci-fi, monsters, anything, so long as it's through a lens that looks exactly like them. Because if that's the kind of person that we're always gonna to cater to, you're never going to innovate. You're never going to change things. You're just gonna keep feeding the picky baby. And we cannot continue to try to create art under a system that is going to bar innovation for fear of a picky baby throwing a tantrum. Hey, maybe we can invite white dudes to play as other people and experience different things through someone else's eyes. And if they don't like it, we have to start thinking we're not losing, they're losing, and we're losing because we're gonna let them stand in the way of our progress and our innovation. Not only is that pandering and checking boxes, but it's also incredibly racist and only looking skin deep when considering their customer base's assumed desires. Of which, for a company that is focusing on wanting to represent underrepresented and marginalized groups, characteristics of which for any other job would be discriminatory to not hire for. She and her company, and all those within the cohort, find it perfectly acceptable, and actually encouraged, to discriminate against white people, even resorting to having Kotaku writing an article to defend Sweet Baby Inc. And the author of said article mentioned that you cannot be racist to white people. They're also saying that I'm anti-Semitic because I said you can't be racist against white people. White Caucasian is a race. So yes, you can be racist to white people. And this is also one of the points that I mentioned to remember prior. As all of the hatred towards white people, something if replacing with any other race would be cancelable actions and blatantly racist is perfectly acceptable in their eyes because it's white people on the receiving end. From the top down is a company that is owned by and employed by racists who claim to be doing good for the marginalized and underrepresented and believe tearing down and replacing a race will do good for all the others. Why this way of trying to include representation and inclusivity seems to work less with gaming compared to other forms of entertainment, such as movies and TV shows, which have had some projects and content be successful with their inclusion and representation, is because the focal points of said inclusion and representation wasn't centered around identity politics characteristics, at least at the beginning, but rather, those characteristics help to emphasize the personality of those represented and included. Also, for those who enjoy games who are like me, meaning having very little time per week to actually sit down and play games, they are a means of escaping reality and bringing in societal issues into games. The majority of players don't want that following them into what they're supposed to be enjoying. If they wanted to play a game featuring real life societal issues, they do so simply by just existing. But games are supposed to be fun. And for many, to experience fantasy worlds and things that are outside of their understanding, to fulfill imaginations with playing as different people, sometimes different creatures that they otherwise would never see or know of, to play in different scenarios that they otherwise would never get the chance to do so, is fun for them. Aside from first-person shooter games or sims, a lot of gamers don't want to play, in the long run, a game that is similar to their own lives or that doesn't add a lot of excitement. Yes, there's lawn mowing simulators, the game where you control the runner's legs to run as far as you can before falling, or even drug dealer simulator. For some, those can be enjoyable for a minute as a means of short-term fun. But for those who want long-term experiences, games similar to fantasy and non-realistic concepts have been a go-to for many to play and to continue playing long-term, even playing through a franchise or a series. However, all of this is just generally speaking. There's a clear difference between representation and good representation. Simply just including diversity for the sake of adding groups A, B, C, 1, 2, 3 is how you get blasphemies such as... We picked the name Trailblazer because she's somebody who charges into action. As a youth, he was exposed to his grandfather's experimental internet gas, and that has patched him permanently into the World Wide Web. Snowflake is non-binary and goes by they, them. It's this idea that these are terms that get thrown around on the internet 
that they don't see as uh, derogatory. To simply check boxes and pass it off as actual inclusion and representation is not only incredibly lazy, but calls into question the sincerity and intentions behind their motives. Such as Elon Musk showing a supposed leak of Disney's inclusivity outline where certain criteria needs to be met to be considered acceptable within their DEI and ESG agendas, of which some of their own staff have been very happy to make public. The showrunners were super welcoming, Meredith Roberts and like the, the our leadership over there has been so welcoming to like my like not at all secret gay agenda. Which led to less focus on the important aspects, like respecting source material to, in favor, have liberty to do with the characters and the story as they please. As I was not very steeped in the comics. I didn't, I didn't read any comics or do any research. I wasn't familiar with the comics. I wasn't familiar with the movies. We didn't lean into a whole lot of the history of the comic books. Yeah, candidly, we were not enormous um, comic fans. I wasn't super into superhero comics when I was a kid. I read a lot of like indie press stuff. First thing I was told is don't read the comics. Really? As a creator, they put you in a bubble. They don't let you talk about any of the other projects, right? You know, they're they're up for anything. We ultimately decided to redefine it for the series and thought that it worked uh, better for the story that we're trying to tell. Could you ever read the, 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 the you, you, you've no. never read the comic book. When the DVD comes out, I'm going to read a Thor comic book and just see where we went wrong. And this is to apparently become normalized and forced upon others. Just as the BlackRock CEO, one of the biggest shareholders and supporters of Disney, had mentioned before. That's an investment criteria for you. Well, behaviors are going to have to change, and this is one thing we're, going to, we're asking companies. Uh, you have to force behaviors, and at BlackRock, we are forcing behaviors. And anyone who opposes or resists these changes should be scared of the consequences of not being DEI and ESG focused, and for all the wrong reasons. Something that Belair commented on herself. Put this stuff up to your higher-ups, and if they don't see the value in what you're asking for when you ask for consultants, when you ask for research, go have a coffee with your marketing team and just terrify them with the possibility of what's going to happen if they don't give you what you want. Because they have to consider, like, I, I say that all out as a joke, but it's actually very, very true. Just as Sweet Baby Inc. running to Kotaku to write a damage control article to cover for like-minded people in the industry. Then having companies like Bungie come out of defense of Sweet Baby Inc and even the US government funded organization take this, encouraging game developers to denounce gamers who are being harassed and defending themselves from Sweet Baby Inc. and its employees. As well as the FBI is to be working with gaming companies to root out the so-called domestic violent extremist content. A children's BBC host, Jules Hardy, mentioning wanting a final purge of gamers who created a separate curation group of a company similar to Sweet Baby Inc. Compulsion Games community manager, Katie Robinson, is apparently being protected, despite declaring her hatred for gamers, as well as claiming, White male gamers were a mistake. And a game developer consultant, Richie DeWitt, promises to destroy the careers of video game company employees if they call out DEI policies. Because any person or company that has to use fear tactics to get their way, as well as try to control how others enjoy any content, are only wanting what's best for everyone involved, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, not really. Never in bad faith or immoral to push their beliefs and ideologies onto others, despite how those affected by their decisions think of the actions being taken. And anyone who does criticize them, by default, is just an istophobe because reasons. To try to simplify all this, when it comes to representation within DEI, what people don't like about what ends up happening is that, generally speaking, studios, the media outlets in favor of said studios, and or those with power in creating said content, all claim that there needs to be more DEI. However, their solution is to just take existing characters, swap around their character traits, then put them back into the content with the same name and story. Just like with Anger Boda, according to Norse mythology, of which was a guideline that they wanted to follow for the game, she is not black, but she was made to be in order to be representative. If you take the mythology out of the equation, or make her another character within the game, then it no longer matters about accuracy. However, it's easier to not make original characters with original stories that would be unique to tell something that pertains to the reason the characters are DEI focused, as then the success of the content wouldn't be guaranteed as it's not established yet. But they would rather just take pre-existing IPs with a large fan base, find characters to swap around their identity politics characteristics, and want full praise for less than half ass effort and call it representation. Oh, that's just lazy writing. But then say players are the problem if their changes are not well received, making their efforts not feel earned, with the praise that they desire, not being deserved for their lackluster effort. It is insulting to those who would actually want to see real changes and stories that pertain to them and their experiences. All this does is create a facade of DEI representation and add to stereotyping as well. Speaking of, for example, to say, this is Mike, he's white, is vastly different than, this is Mike, and he just happens to be white. Someone's skin color is a trait that they cannot control. So to compare skin color, 
whether it be for segregation, discrimination, and or to create inferiority and superiority complexes among different races, is racist. <laughs> Additionally, this is Mike. He's white. Gives the impression of stereotyping and already preconceived expectations on the person's personality as a whole, with his skin color being the defining characteristics of what makes Mike, Mike. However, this is Mike, and he just happens to be white. Gives the impression of his skin color being nothing to do with who he is, but rather is an afterthought as his skin color is just one characteristic that makes up who he is, and isn't even a prominent factor of his personality. With how much Kim Belair and the employees at Sweet Baby Inc. seem to judge not only others when it comes to race, but also the importance of their work as a whole, how have none of you remembered? I have a dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Belair said something that very few people seem to catch on to, but when she mentioned, I once worked on a project where they had an all white cast and they expressed their desire like, okay, we need to mix it up a bit. How about this character is kind of like stereotypically French. So they have a beret and they have like a striped shirt. And I was like, okay, if you need to do that, can we at least make them a person of color? And they said, oh no. That would be weird. They're already French. She was accepting and fine with the idea of stereotyping someone, so long as they could possibly meet her requirements. It's ironic to think about, as those who are marginalized and underrepresented, generally speaking, wouldn't want people to solely think of them as for the stereotypes that they have upon their uncontrollable characteristics, a lot of which can be very harmful. So to even entertain such a thought goes against her brand's core message significantly. Gotcha, bitch. For her to be okay with stereotyping, Belair, would you consider these okay? God, man. Yeah. How much signal I need to cut across eight lane? None? I turn now. Good luck, everybody else. I have anxiety, depression, OCD, BPD, FOMO, and social anxiety. So you're at least single. No, I have a sugar daddy. All black people love fried chicken, watermelon, Kool-Aid. Cornbread. No, this just sound good as a motherfucker. You cannot use confirmation bias to just nitpick the ideas that you would feel to be okay and dismiss all those who would not benefit your cause. And with her being okay with stereotyping, so long as it fits her DEI initiative, and as another point to remember from earlier, this actually makes her the one being the picky baby. And the only babies throwing a tantrum are sweet baby ink employees, like the one on Steam trying to run damage control or Lego butts. For her to make the claim that white people need to see the gains from a similar perspective as their own skin color is not only racist, but incredibly shallow, especially with her mentioning that if she can appeal to a broader audience, then they can please their core audience. For her company, who strives for representation and inclusion, she seems to lack the understanding that for games to allow character customization in all regards, to have their in-game appearance not reflect the player's experience differing between one another's appearance, is inclusive for all players. This allows for exactly as she mentioned, reaching a broader audience, which then could please the core audience. Yes, some people would want to make a reflection of themselves in games. Again, she did admit that that concept seemed weird before. This is genuinely embarrassing to relate to a crowd of people, but for a really long time before this, when I was offered like a character customization screen, I was like, well, I can't put myself in there because that that's weird and not what video games are. But the idea that she claims that white people wouldn't like a game because it wouldn't feature a white character to play, I'll personally never understand how she could justify that claim. All of this is showing how very out of touch these game developers and their DEI consulting partners are with their target audiences. Now, are there some people who will not play a game because they're racist and don't want to play a character that doesn't look and act as they do? Sure. But with that incredibly minute statistic out of the way, of which the exceptions don't define the rule, players care more about the story or the game mechanics over whom the playable characters are as far as the looks or any other identity politics characteristics. And remember that she mentioned that the majority of the player base is made of cis white men. Cis hetero white dude or just adjacent to that. With that taken into consideration, why then was Tomb Raider successful? Why has Final Fantasy been successful? Why has Resident Evil remained successful? The answer is, the stories were well liked, the characters were written well, and who they are as people wasn't based on identity politics, of which they would have character growth and arcs that could vary between the games, and they are never pushed forward or held back by factors that make up who they are that they cannot control. Again, identity politics. Players can relate to whom they play as simply based off their character and personality, regardless of what they look like or identify as, because only shallow individuals believe that they can only relate to one another if they look exactly like them or have to see themselves on screen. For example, there's going to be a Black Panther game coming out in the near future, of which I will not be playing because one of the prominent people helping work on the game is an ex-Sweet Baby Inc. employee who has mentioned not wanting to hire or work with white people. 
who is your team? Validate has a team of mostly people, mostly all people of color. We have no white people on our team. Um, I did that because I wanted to create a safe environment. And I know the best way for an environment to be safe is to be around people who are just like me. However, sticking with just the character, he looks nothing like me as far as skin color. He grew up very differently than how I did and lives a lifestyle that I couldn't and wouldn't ever relate to. But I can still relate and empathize with him as a person. Throughout his first movie, we see how his character growth occurs, especially in questioning not only himself and his beliefs, but also feeling betrayed and lied to by his father, whom abandoned Killmonger in his time that he needed help and support the most, even to the point of T'Challa not wanting to kill Killmonger, as well as fulfilling his last wish to see the beauty of Wakanda in his final moments. He also is very family oriented and wants to be the leader that not only he feels he can be, but the one that his people need him to be to protect and serve them as needed. Absolutely nothing I just mentioned had anything to do with T'Challa's race, sexual orientation, or any other identity politics factors that are beyond his control, but he is still a likable and relatable character that audiences can enjoy. Additionally, circling back to the upcoming game, using Belair's logic of inclusivity and representation, as within Wakanda, white people would be the minority and have no representation. However, I fully accept that and hope that they wouldn't add a white character in for the sake of inclusivity, as it would make no sense aside from it being a token character. I enjoyed the movie for what it was without needing to see someone like myself on screen. And within the game, I wouldn't need to play as someone who could potentially represent someone like me to enjoy the experience that the game developers would want to give to their audience. But again, it has Sweet Baby Ink Association, so this one is a skip for me. I'm going to make quite a bit of references to Hollywood in this response, because a lot of references I'll be mentioning will be more familiar with the general viewership of this video versus the smaller audience base within just gaming. Hollywood's experience with these issues have been going on for much longer. Although the gaming industry may bring in more money overall, the reach that the movie industry has is vastly greater, and they also have more of a buffer within their audience and customers than how it is within the gaming industry. With saying that, it seems that Sweet Baby Inc. is only taking inspiration from Hollywood for the way that they handle criticism instead of understanding the market and what players actually want. I mentioned that Sweet Baby Inc. and the game developers that they work with seem very out of tune with the gaming audience to think that they know what they want in a game and opt for assuming that whatever content they create, players would like and learn to adapt with the changing times within society as a whole. An issue with assuming what audiences would want is that, in the case for Sweet Baby Inc., they started putting their own ideas into the game that are more niche than what the general player base would enjoy. Why taking such liberties within the movie industry has worked in the past is because, one, the general audience is much more vast and varied between what people tend to enjoy. Two, it was a slow buildup of change over time instead of trying to go full force into their ideas and force feed it into their audiences. 3. The investment from the audience is much smaller, being movies can be roughly $15 to $20 if watching an IMAX, with an average of 2-3 to three hours to view the movies. Compare this to the $70 plus average for games, with some taking 30, 40, 50 hours or more to complete. There's more at stake for those playing video games, of which, the player base is vastly smaller in comparison to the audience of those who enjoy movies, who have much less investment towards their entertainment. Taking a look at movies break even points, the general rule of assumption, as movie studios seldom ever give exacts for their full budgets, it's safe to assume that it would be two and a half times the production budget to break even. Factoring in marketing, theater cuts, post-production, additional photography or reshoots, cost of cast promotional touring to sell the movie, as well as the red carpet premieres, to name a few expenses within the overall budget. Understanding this, looking at Marvel, almost everything after Endgame, aside from No Way Home, which is primarily a Sony movie, then Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness, and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Everything else has bombed at the box office, or have been loss leaders that eventually turned into just complete losses. A loss leader is a concept primarily seen in the food industry, as an item or combo is meant to be cheaper, but would encourage purchasing more, such as with ordering drinks that have a greater profit margin compared to food, to make up for and add value to the order overall, hence a loss leader. However, all aside from the aforementioned movies have been losses, some in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And anything put under Disney Plus right away is intended to be a loss leader to encourage people to subscribe to their streaming platform. But with Disney Plus bleeding subscribers, they are now purely just losses of immense amounts. Belair discussed the idea of using inclusion as a source of marketing. Treat representation as a facet of innovation, as a selling point. Leverage your game's ability to explore new perspectives. Um, and there's always going to be a positive impact in assuming this. Let's look at a movie that did the exact thing that she described, The Eternals from Marvel. 
that movie's marketing all the way up to the red carpet premiere was just focused on discussing how diverse the cast was. Diverse, different, 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 different diversity. You're a woman of color as well. Representation. For so long, we've seen superheroes that have looked like a small percentage of the world different. We have a lot of representation. Diverse. Everybody looks different. Everybody sounds different. Diversity and the inclusion. Different, different way. Diverse, diverse, diverse. However, when people finally watched the movie, it sucked. It was way too long for what the movie was trying to do, as well as it was a huge exposition piece with very little action to show for it, which is one of the things that Marvel was best known for. Yes, the cast was diverse, but that alone ultimately amounted to adding nothing of value to the story or push the plot forward, and it ended up bombing at the box office. Then, for the disaster known as Amazon's Rings of Power, a large majority of their marketing was spent on the same type of marketing tactics. We're getting like more diversity. 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 Much more diversity. Being inclusive. Representative. Representation. Black elf. Female dwarf. Wow. Never saw people in my color. So amazing. Women in it. Women. More female representation. I wasn't represented. My disability. My queerness wasn't represented. That show was horrible. And Galadriel was a huge Mary Sue, and ended up being one of the most unlikable characters made, insulting not only to Tolkien himself, but his fans from the trilogy series. And the show ended up flying too close to the sun from the source material and got burned. Just like what literally happened in The Eternals. The audiences have started rejecting movies involved with pushing DEI agendas and narratives because, as I showed earlier, writers, directors, and producers are changing the content in favor of chasing the vocal minority that only want to see change, but otherwise would not support it all in favor of straying away from what the diehard fans that made them popular and successful actually want. This leaves the diehard fans disappointed, and with the vocal minority whom demanded change, not showing up in support of said changes, but rather just wanting something to complain about, see if anything happens, and then move on to the next thing to complain about without actually supporting the changes that they asked for, finally leaving Disney CEO Bob Iger to admit that they have lost touch with what their audience desires. Which isn't true. It's a damage control statement because one of their biggest investors is BlackRock, and they are in favor of pushing the DEI agenda into content, so Disney will happily keep taking the ESG money from them, while simultaneously acting as though that they don't know what is going on, all to save face and act as though they are good people with good intentions. When fans don't support the content, both in no longer showing up or watching on TV, as well as delete criticism and negative reviews, even if it's deserving of them, these studios attack fans saying that it's their fault for the failure of their content, and call the audience every istophobe buzzword that they can think of as a means of trying to shame them into submission. Well, technically speaking, they're right. By the audience not paying for tickets at the theaters, or adding to the watch time on streaming, the audience is the reason that the studios failed to meet their own expectations. However, that is the line of the responsibility with the audience, and the rest of the blame falls solely on the studios. This is exactly what happened with Elizabeth Banks' reboot for Charlie's Angels, first saying it's not a film for men and that it is a feminist movie. Then, when it inevitably bombed, she changed the narrative to blaming men, the very demographic that the movie was apparently not made for, for not showing up to watch the movie, and then backpedaled on it not being a feminist movie. The same thing went for Bros, which in the trailer took aim at straight males and when it eventually bombed, with needing around under just $50 million in order to break even. Billy Eigner blamed men for homophobia, when not even gay men turned out in large numbers to watch this movie, which only went to show that they didn't feel the representation was adequate for them to actually want to go out and watch it. Damn! Then for the Marvels and Madam Web, both girl boss movies, men were to blame for their box office failures, when the majority of the audience that did go to see those movies were men showing that it was actually women that were a huge part in both movies' failures. I know that some will think that the Hollywood examples were unnecessary and a diversion from the main topic as this is about gaming, but I wanted to show similarities and patterns with another entertainment industry, one of which has had more room for error, greater range with their audience, and whom has been around for much longer. Even with all of those factors into play, especially taking into consideration for my main example, Disney, a once very loved and highly regarded children's entertainment company, not even they could escape the negative repercussions of the same DEI narrative and agenda pushing that companies like Sweet Baby Inc. are doing now, which then begs the question for Kim Belair and companies like Sweet Baby Inc. If it couldn't work out for Disney, why do they think that it would work out for them? You're just out of your mind. That's a delusion of grandeur. These same shame blaming tactics have been used in the gaming industry as well, especially now from Sweet Baby Inc. and all of those who defend them in this issue. What studios, regardless of the medium of their entertainment, fail to realize is your audience owes you absolutely nothing. And it is you that actually owes them. You are the ones trying to bring entertainment into their lives to get them to check out your content. And in time, hopefully become a repeat customer. And in turn, if they are entertained, they could support you by buying tickets to your movies, buying games, or possibly making purchases through microtransactions, to name a few examples. Just because you have made content doesn't give you the right to feel entitled to their money. 
and or to feel that you are owed for your work, as what people in general find entertaining is subjective. And entertainment as a whole, regardless of how it's consumed, isn't a necessity in life that everyone has to partake in. You owe your potential and target audience entertainment that they feel is enjoyable and valuable. But if they don't find interest in your content, they have the right to refuse it and to make judgments upon it. This is exactly how DSP, or Darkside Phil, live streamer and professional e-beggar, treats his viewers in his streams. Every day, he makes his financial woes his audience's problem. I am completely out of money and I need to pay at least three to four bill more bills. Constantly begging for support simply because he plays games on stream. It would be great if we could hit at least the hat goal for today. Keep in mind, this is the only stream I did today and we haven't even made enough tips that would have been like one normal stream. So if we could get just a few more and hit that hat goal, at the very least, that would be somewhere to start. At least I would have had enough. I'm not even kidding you. Right now, I don't even have enough tips to pay for the meal I got. <laughs> I'm serious. Shaming them for not giving him enough in tips, super chats, and memberships. But outside of that, any support would be appreciated. Right now, I've gotten one tip in a whole hour, and that's it. Literally nothing else. No super chats, no memberships, no other tips. One singular tip. Let me get one new member tonight. Just one. That's all I ask. Here you go. We literally got no new members today in an amazing day of streaming. Give me one member and I'll be happy for tonight. That's all I ask. How about that? One person become a member tonight and I'll be ecstatic because I'm upset that we got no members today. And I know we could do better than that. And anyone who criticizes his business model is chastised and ridiculed before eventually being given a ban. Fuck you. You are so fucking stupid. And to the fucking piece of shit who does a super chat and threatens me in chat, how about you go fuck yourself, you fucking human piece of fucking fecal matter. Everyone shut up about someone being banned in the chat. What are you, four years old? Shut up. Banned, 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 banned. Gone. Forever. We'll see how it works when you come back to, this, to the fucking community night and see how welcome you are. Because we know your name now. <laughs> and that's just how he treats his audience on a day-to-day -day basis. He thinks much, much less of his detractors. Fuck those people. I don't give a fuck about them. The very people that are the reason that he remains to have any relevancy. Check out my DSP documentary to check out more on him as a whole, as well as a deep dive on his dynamic with a PDF file, who is also his number one super fan. But in the case for Sweet Baby Inc., a lot of what they're asking for, I can understand. However, Belair does realize that she is just a worker for a larger company. We still work for people. And it's another kettle of fish, I think, when it comes to like the structures that approve these choices. And we have to kind of look at them a little more institutionally because we can write all the stories that we want, but that doesn't mean that anyone's going to buy them, anyone's going to market them, anyone's going to let us do it. And companies need to stay in business, meaning that they need to make money. I need money. A lot of the ideas that she is trying to advocate for are very niche ideas that wouldn't resonate with a large general audience. Hence when she says marginalized and underrepresented groups. And as mentioned before, a lot of people don't tend to agree with the identity politics and woke agenda being forced upon them within society. So a lot of Belair's ideas only fit within a very small subgroup of players. Diversity, equity, We've got inclusion, here. See, nobody cares. Yeah. to focus on those ideas over what the general player base would want. Because I think so often when people like us get told, you know, from higher ups or from society at large, this isn't what players want. It's not a conversation about demographics, sorry, content. It's a conversation about demographics. And I think that in our industry and in so many creative industries, if you want to look at film and television and any art form, we start treating our core demographics as a fixed and static value, something that does not want to change and something that is locked in place. So despite like the changing face of audiences, despite the changing face of conferences like this one, we still look at our core demographics and say, okay, they're white, cis, hetero, males. And we cater almost exclusively to them. And the problem is that we don't just cater to them like, you know, here, here's something that we think you'll enjoy. We cater to them the way that we cater to like a picky baby. We feed them the same thing that we know that they love and we keep on feeding it. We're like, here you go, we, you love it. Eat this, eat this, eat this. So that then when they get anything else, they react as a picky baby would, which is be like, whoa, no, thank you. I do not want this. And we've actually done this so long that what we're doing is creating an entire nation of picky babies and they make us scared to deviate from what we actually want to do just in case these picky babies don't want to play our games. Would mean less sales, less revenue, and the risk of running out of business. It's funny how so much of what she's mentioned is catered towards AAA studios and their games. However, she tends to seldom discuss smaller indie studios and their games. Look here, look, listen. 
I may have been born at night, but not last night. She knows exactly what she's doing. She understands that the big money to keep her company and those within the cohort running comes from the studios with larger budgets since that's where the big dollars come from. However, she should take her ideas to smaller studios, or rather, make her own and actually make a game that caters to the issues she and her company represent and advocate for, and see how well the sales numbers are. If sales numbers are high, that's more proof that her concept would be more successful. However, if the money doesn't flow, it only proves my point. And for companies that care about staying in business, this is why they need to be in touch with what their audience wants and expects of them. The more niche of a concept, the less of an audience that it has, no matter how righteous or inclusive it may be. But being able to appeal to your general audience and to make content that your customers like, that's more inclusive of more people to take interest and enjoy the content as a whole, and hopefully be repeat customers to keep you in business, should be the main goal overall. But if that concept fails, to go to the length of trying to feel the need to try a scare tactic to get her away is very suspicious behavior and calls into question the sincerity of her intentions, which then fuels the fire for more criticism. Thus, this never ending cycle continues and not in their favor. This can lead critics to believe that Sweet Baby Inc's slogan should be, we create problems that don't exist to sell you a solution. Because if they feel the need to resort to using fear tactics to get their points across, it gives more justification that if there wasn't a problem to solve before, either do as we desire, or we will make it your problem until you succumb to our ways or are canceled. Believe what I say or I'll hurt you. Ah, you're getting it. Now, with everything that I've said up to this point, it's easy to think that I'm putting all the blame on Sweet Baby Inc. and companies like them for the shoehorning of identity politics, as well as the DEI agendas and narratives within video games. Well, they are to blame, but they aren't the full extent of the problem. They are companies used by game studios as consultants, and they only have a job because they are employed by said studios. Both Sweet Baby Inc. and the studios that employ them have their fair share of blame, and they even justify one another's purpose. With the shifting in society's norms, game studios take inspiration to what they think their audiences want. Because they see consulting companies like Sweet Baby Inc., they feel it to be more normalized and justified to think and want to add new ideas into their games. And companies like Sweet Baby Inc. have concepts that they want to sell. And with game studios wanting guidance and adding new ideas into their games, they are hired to do the work for the studios. For a lack of a better dynamic term, it can be similar in concept to being symbiotic. The problem right now is that so many people want to see Sweet Baby Inc. gone. But if this was to happen, just like with a Hydra, one company being gone will only mean more companies coming in to try to fulfill the needs left behind by Sweet Baby Inc. I'm not naive to believe that Sweet Baby Inc. is the only company who believes and acts as they do, but there has been a list collected of similar companies to Sweet Baby Inc. that are known so far. I honestly don't want Sweet Baby Inc. to go anywhere at this moment, because one of the hardest enemies to face is one that you don't know exists. And at this point, we know Sweet Baby Inc. and their intentions. And hopefully, following suit, others will be brought to light in the near future. However, as a double-edged sword, I do feel that criticizing Sweet Baby Inc. is also justifiable. And despite many others who say to leave Sweet Baby Inc. alone, for fear that once they are gone, other companies will be kept in secrecy of their involvement as consultants to the same DEI agendas and narratives. What the attention that Sweet Baby Inc. has gotten has shown is that players do not like and agree with the ideas that the company not only stands for, but also in the manner of which they are trying to make others accept their involvement. Despite other companies stepping in to do their work if they are gone, this is a clear message to developers that they are being watched, that players do not like what they are doing, and players are becoming familiar with how the final product is that has been handled by companies such as Sweet Baby Inc. and the like. Even if gaming studios start having in-house consultants to fulfill the role that Sweet Baby Inc. provided, players are becoming apparent enough to see through the lines and take notice of what to avoid. What makes the difference in seeing change is speaking in a way that companies all universally understand, through your wallets. This attention is not only starting to hurt Sweet Baby Inc., but also has been creating inconveniences for gaming studios with receiving unwanted attention. And if players are able to recognize that their voice is heard most when speaking through their wallets, meaning not buying the games that buy into the DEI ideals, this will send the message that studios will hear loud and clear. As with the large budgets that these studios use to create games, they can't afford failures if they are to continue to stay in business. When games come out broken at launch, as the studios don't allow developers adequate time to finish and polish their games, as studios would rather please their shareholders for the short-term profit, at the expense of the long-term profit from releasing unfinished games with promises to patch updates soon after launch, and make their player bases unhappy, tell them how you feel. When they add in ideals that you don't believe in, especially in the case such as with Sweet Baby Inc.'s agendas, tell them how you feel. When companies blame you for their content not being liked, as they have their own expectations on what they think that you should like without truly understanding what you actually want, tell them how you feel. They only will be allowed to continue as they are if they receive no pushback or resistance, as an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by an outside source, meaning you, their audience and consumers. 
You owe them nothing. They owe you entertainment. And the more out of touch they get with their audience's interests and desires with their games, the smaller their already smaller player base that they have will shrink. Sweet Baby Inc. is a problem, but they're only the symptom of a much greater issue going on. Companies like them will only go away if studios see the shift in the interest of the vocal group who voice their wants, not only within gaming, but society as a whole. Nothing changes if nothing changes.